Thank you very much, Ruben. Very powerful, beautiful music here this afternoon. Appreciate that very much. The Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread will be here before we know it. Actually, I was counting the weeks. It's only five uh, Sabbaths until we'll be observing those days. Certainly, we're going to be covering the familiar themes uh, before and, and on those holy days. Forgiveness, uh, sin, what is sin, God's law, Christ's sacrifice, the Exodus, the Passover, uh, Israel out of Egypt, and so on. One indispensable con uh, concept is not always explored uh, quite as often, and that is very much associated with this time of year, and that's the subject of grace. The subject of grace. Notice how it's used in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. Acts 20, 24. We've tended at times in the church to shy a little bit away from this biblical doctrine and teaching because of sometimes the abuse that mainstream Christianity seems to uh, use it, the, the application of it, and that if you just believe and then you're under grace, and that's kind of the, the end of the story. And we've tended to, to not want to go there and maybe haven't always explored it as, um, as we can and as is important. In Acts 20 and verse 24, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So he simply identified another way of stating the gospel. Sure, it's the gospel of the kingdom of God, eternal life and the kingdom of God and God's overall plan, but he, he's not afraid to call it the gospel of the grace of God, because it's a fundamental principle having to do with salvation and God's plan for mankind. So the gospel or the new covenant is based on grace. Can we really renew our New, co new Testament covenant with God without a grasp and an understanding of what is grace? And what are we talking about? What do we need to know about it? Hardly can cover it in one, one particular sermon, of course. The concept of grace often is counterintuitive uh, to just nature itself because, well, we go to school and we get grades based on what we did. You get this grade for getting th these tests and uh, the success you had on those tests, that's your grade and that's your reward, you might say. We get a salary based on our skill and our ability, what we've earned for that salary. We get a position on a sports team based on our ability, based on our hard work and various factors. You kind of a reward for that. And it's all according to performance. It's merit-based. Well, performance is very, very much a part of Christianity. That's certainly very true. It says we're rewarded according to our works. So performance is vital. Let's read a couple verses. 1 John 3.22. We don't want to go to one, one concept and then minimize others. It's a matter of putting everything together. But we have to also bring in grace as it's intended to be applied. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22 Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because there's something we're doing. Not always just according to it, you know, measure for measure. But we do receive of him because we keep his commandments. We do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Meaning if we're doing things that are displeasing, well, we can't expect the same response from God. Not if we're willfully doing that. Luke 21, I won't turn there. You're familiar with this. Luke 21, 36. Watch you therefore, pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. There's an accounting. There's a worthiness. There's a performance. And that has to do with our spiritual life, our, our life as Christians. There's a performance factor involved in that. Grace doesn't nullify that, nor does that mean there's no need for the grace of God. We wouldn't want to go there either. So there, it is merit-based, you might say, but there's an aspect of true Christianity that is not merit-based. 
a very important aspect of true Christianity that is not merit-based, based on what we've di done, our righteousness, our works. There's that issue and factor as well. Mainstream Christianity often confuses the two. How do they apply? What does it mean? Grace, the grace of God, a lot about grace in the Christian community. Well, we don't always have a perfect understanding of all things of God either, and it helps us to review things also. Romans 2 and verse 4, let's read this. It's God's grace that calls us and leads us to repentance. So the grace of God, Romans 2 and verse 4, let me read this first. Or despise you the riches of God's goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing the goodness of God leads you to repentance. So grace is not really just when God forgives your sins. Well, that's part of grace. The grace of God forgives us because of Christ's sacrifice. But that's not all grace is, because here it says, the goodness of God leads us to repenting. The goodness of God would call us to God, where we would then repent. So the grace of God is extended before we even repent. It's a much broader, broader application of that. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, through his grace, sent his son to die for our sins. Long before we repent, John 1 and verse 14. John 1, 14. Just giving a, a broader sense of what grace is, certainly applies to being forgiven, but not only forgiveness. Because here, John 1, 14, the word became flesh, dwelled among us, and we have seen his glory the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace. It says Christ was full of grace. Well, he was never forgiven anything, never sinned, yet he had a fullness of the grace of God. What is that? It wasn't something that he, he had the grace of God, I'm sure, from the time that he, Mary was carrying him. And as a young baby and a child, the grace of God, it wasn't something he did at that point. Well, we, I'll read Numbers chapter 6 to you and just getting a sense of this, a sense of the concept of grace. Numbers 6, 24 and 25, here's Moses and God's sentiment towards ancient Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious toward you. The God, God extend his loving grace towards you, to be gracious towards his people, to give them benefits and give them blessings, give them help, not all of which they would earn by any means, but just the gracious, graciousness of God, the favor of God would come upon them. So grace is defined it's not a reward. Grace is defined as a condition of unmerited favor or blessing. God's goodness is extended that is not qualified for or earned by our works. We get reward. We were rewarded according to our works, and that's right and good. God responds based on how we do things. But the element of grace is really not based on that, fundamentally, on what we've qualified for or what we've always earned. I would, uh, in, in trying to explain it, I would, I would liken it to parents. The concept would be like parents, and a parent, a parent especially the mother, when the mother is carrying a child, both parents, the mother, I think, especially, has an especial bond and care and love for the unborn child she's carrying. It's hard to define that exactly. It's a spiritual quality. The child is loved before the child is born. You, well, it's been a good child or about, hadn't been anything. It's just a child. And the parents love the child and care for it. After the child's born, of course, they love the child. When it's a babe, when it's an infant, a toddler, 
They promise to take care of that child. It's not all based on how's the child doing. It's parental love. A special attachment, a connection, sometimes called unconditional love. A love that is extended towards a child at at any age, actually. Well, God created families. It's a creation of God. Man and woman leave their uh, father and mother, cleave to their mate. God created families, a fundamental building block of society. Society is combating that, undermining that, eroding the family unit, the marriage, uh, the the sexual relationship between a man and a woman and what it's designed for. It's all being eroded, minimized. But God created that. There's a bond in a family between a parent and a child. Well, brothers and sisters, for that matter. A a bond, a special affinity and feeling and love. A family bond. The connection is, you can't explain that. It's a spiritual quality. You can't really explain it anyway. The love a parent has for a child, or brothers and sisters, family, they remember. We're family. It's a spiritual quality. God's created that. It's to strengthen that bond, that unit, that family that God's created. Well, Christians, like, like children, have that same relationship with God, and we can call it the grace of God. That's how God looks on his children. It's like a parent would a child. We can call that the grace of God. Kind of hard to define, but yet we experience it. We know what it's like. Galatians 5.18, Galatians 5.18. These are sometimes confusing concepts, especially here, Galatians 5.18. If you're led by the Spirit, if you're led by the Spirit, you're a Christian. You've been baptized. Receive the Holy Spirit. So if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. In other words, everything that is, bases our relationship with God is not just on law-keeping. Just like the same with a parent and their child. The bond that is there is not just based on what's the child doing. It's the fact that it's, a, it's your child, your family. Connection and the bond is there. Well, we have that. We're not just, our relationship is not just based on the law of God with God. We're his children. We're under the grace of God, thankfully so. None of us wants to rely on our goodness, hopefully so. So the law of God doesn't generate grace. Grace comes through faith and the Holy Spirit. Now, maybe this story would would help illustrate uh, a little bit of the concept. It's a little bit difficult at times to grasp. As a matter of fact, some of the problem, both from a physical standpoint, is children can grow up in a family and never feel an unconditional love from the parent. They just don't feel that. It's always maybe a discipline thing and a a performance. They just never have owned that. And that can be true in a spiritual sense in people's relationship with God. They just haven't been able to own that God does love them, that that you're his child. Well, this is something written by a Timothy Paul Jones. Kind of an interesting story. Our middle daughter had been previously adopted by another family. I'm sure this couple had the the best of intentions, but they never quite integrated the adopted child into their family of biological children. It just wasn't the same. Well, after a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption. We ended up welcoming the eight-year-old girl into our home. Didn't work out in the other one, so we we took the eight-year-old in. Now, for one reason or another, whenever our daughter's previous family vacationed at Disney World, they took their biological children with them, but they left their adopted daughter with a family friend. 
Usually, at least in the child's mind, this happened because she did something wrong that precluded her presence on the trip. She acted up, so she didn't go. And so by the time we adopted our daughter, she had seen many pictures of Disney World, and she had heard about the rides and the characters and the parades, but when it came to passing through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, she had always been the one left on the outside. Well, once I found out about this history, I made plans to take her to Disney World the next time a speaking engagement took our family to the southeastern United States. We're all, we're going to Disney World. Magic Kingdom. I thought I had mastered the Disney World drill. I knew from previous experiences that the prospect of seeing cast members in freakishly oversized mouse and duck costumes somehow, somehow turns children into squirming bundles of emotional instability. What I didn't expect was that the prospect of visiting this dream world would produce a stream of downright devilish behavior in our newest daughter. In the month leading up to our trip to the Magic Kingdom, she stole food when a simple request would have gained her a snack. She lied when it would have been easier to tell her the truth, uh, uh, to tell the truth. She whispered insults that were carefully crafted to hurt her older sister as deeply as possible. And as the days on the calendar moved closer to the trip, her mutinies multiplied. A couple of days before our family headed to Florida, Florida I pulled our daughter into my lap to talk uh, through her latest escapade. I know what you're, what you're going to do, she stated flatly. You're, going to, you're, going, uh, you're not going to take me to Disney World, are you? Well, the thought hadn't actually crossed my mind, but her downward spiral suddenly started to make some sense. She knew she couldn't earn her way into the Magic Kingdom. She had tried and failed that test several times before, so she was living in a way that placed her as far as possible from the most magical place on earth. In retrospect I'm, uh, retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit that in that moment, I was tempted to turn her fear into my, my own advantage. The easiest response would have been, and if you don't start behaving better, you're right, you're not going, girl. But by, the, by God's grace, he puts it, I didn't. Instead, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded, brown eyes wise, wide and tear rimmed. Are you part of this family? She nodded again. Then you're going with us. Sure, there may be some consequences to help you remember what's right and what's wrong, but you're part of our family. We're not leaving you behind. Well, I'd like to say that her behaviors grew better after that moment. They didn't. Her choices pretty much spiraled out of control at every hotel and rest stop all the way to Lake Buena Vista. Still, we headed to Disney World on the day we had promised. And it was a typical Disney day. Overpriced tickets, <laughs> overpriced meals, <laughs> lots of lines mingled with just enough manufactured magic to consider maybe going again someday. <laughs> In our hotel room that evening, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted, pensive, and a little weepy at times, but her month-long facade of rebellion had faded. When bedtime rolled around, I prayed with her, held her, and asked, so how was your first day at Disney World? She closed her eyes and snuggled down into her stuffed unicorn. After a few moments, she opened her eyes ever so slightly Daddy, she said, I finally got to go to Disney World, but it wasn't because I was good, it was because I'm yours. Now, the story, obviously, I would hasten to add, is not an endorsement for misbehavior by any means, and that was not acceptable, and obviously, you're going to lose privileges, and there's going to be punishment of one type or another if we misbehave, that's natural. But there's the broader principle here. As I mentioned before, um, that it's something it looks like she finally was able to feel a part of that family. Finally able to experience that, and she owned what we would call grace. She was part of the family. It was extended to her because she was a child, and she finally sensed and realized and experienced it. Not all kids do. 
Sometimes not all of God's children do in the way that he would like us to understand it. As I mentioned, it doesn't nullify right behavior, and obviously some children today need more. If you know, have been out, as I mentioned before, in some of the stores and everything, some of our children need more consequences at times for not listening or whatever the infraction might be. So it doesn't nullify that, but there's also the very vital need for the grace that comes in a family, the family of God, that unconditional love that God wants us to feel as well. well she finally, finally owned that. She finally got it. And after that, her behavior changed because it meant so much different. Well, God's grace gives us many promises, many promises. Ephesians 2, verse 8. It's the grace of God, not the law of God. The grace of God gives us many promises. Now, Mr. Taylor mentioned, mentioned uh, some a couple weeks ago about the whole healing, the grace of God, the promises, the reliance we can have upon God in his time, in his way, according to his will. It's a promise he gives to us. We can rest upon that. We can feel we're in God's hands. Because of his grace, we don't look inward to our own goodness qualifying us for that or earning that. Well, Ephesians 2 and verse 8, this is why I mentioned about it being fundamental to Passover and unleavened bread and the new covenant. It's by grace are you saved through your faith. Obviously, we have to believe in the grace of God. By grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. That's a gift of God, not a reward. It's not a, not a reward of God, not something earned. It's a gift like we give gifts to our children. Hopefully, every time we give a gift to our children, they don't say, oh my, I don't, what, what did I do? I don't even remember what I did to get you. You didn't do anything. We wanted to give this to you. I want you to be happy. We enjoy giving gifts. God enjoys giving gifts. It comes from the grace of God. Salvation is through God's grace. Nobody's going to qualify to earn that. John 6, 54, here's what Jesus said. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, kind of threw the apostles for a loop on that occasion, till they understood it, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Well, they didn't have it then. We don't have eternal life, but in another sense, yes, we do. By the grace of God, the will of God, the will of God is to give eternal life. So you have eternal life. It abides in us through grace. We have to stay in the faith. There, is, there are some ifs. We're said to have eternal life. Romans 8.30. Romans 8.30. Moreover, whom he did predestine... Then he called, the ones that he's called, we've been justified, our past sins have been justified, we've been forgiven because we had faith, the sacrifice that Christ gave on our behalf that reconciled us to God so we can be forgiven. And the people that he justified, that would be us, then he also glorified. Well, you're not glorified yet, neither am I. Why would it say past tense? We've been glorified. Because in the plan of God, through the grace of God, that's his will. That's the plan. That's what he intends. We're as good as glorified, only not yet. Like it says in Hebrews 2. We've been put over all things, only not yet. That's the plan. That's the grace of God. All of it comes through God's grace. A couple more of the promises God gives through his grace. First uh, John 1:9, 1 John 1:9, important verse at this time of year as well.
whereby are given, uh, first, uh, John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. That's the, the, it's not the law doing it. It's repentance does it. So the grace of God gets extended, the grace of God that forgives us and cleanses us from all righteousness. And finally, I'll read 2 Peter 1, 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Exceeding great precious promises. Like a parent promises a children, a child, I'll take you to Disney World. I'll pay for your college. I'll do such and such. Promises. Not a, and those are not all based on, you know, you've got to do this, this, this to earn it. Yeah, you might have things to participate in, but the parents want to do that too. It's the grace of a parent. Well, Christians enter this state of grace whereby we get promises. That comes through baptism. That's when we become the children of God, receive the Holy Spirit. We become a part of God's family, just like that children came from another home they didn't want her. <laughs> Too many problems. And so we brought her into our home, adopted her, and she's in our family now. When we're baptized, we're in God's family. There's children. But we have to be in the family to receive these promises. If we're not baptized, we're not in a condition of grace. It's fundamental. that We don't have the promises. We're not baptized. The family bond is not the same. Now, that, that's not to say that God has no relationship with anybody. Uh, let's say our children, because they're not baptized yet. Yes, it's like the disciples in Jesus' time God was working with those disciples. God was blessing them. They were even sent out and, and had miracles being done. But they still had to receive the Holy Spirit to be under grace. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Here's, here's an example how the unbaptized, if we're doing what God is asking us to do at this point in our lives, 1 Corinthians 7, 14, The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, the unbelieving wife sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but your children are holy children. They're not baptized yet. They're considered holy. In a sense, they're under God's grace because of that circumstance that they're in. They're part of the family. But there's at some point that even keeping the commandments of God, keeping the Sabbath, the holy days, will only go so far because the law is limited. And only, it can only do so much. We have to end up receiving God's Spirit and come under the grace of God. Be really a part of that family. Enter that new covenant, and that's what we renew at Passover. Renew that condition of grace. 1 John 1.17. 1 John 1.17. The law was given through Moses. That law was good. Matter of fact, he came down from the mountain. His face was shining. They could hardly look on him. The glory of the law of God. That was the old covenant. The physical covenant. So that was given through Moses. But grace and truth come through Christ. And the new covenant. And if we're in Christ, baptized, we're under Grace. You cannot place a value on that. You cannot place a value on the grace of God and be under the grace of God within that grace. Wouldn't want to sell that for anything. Be part of the pearl of great price. <clears throat> well, millions are baptized, I'm sure, and well-meaning in the Christian world, all around the world, all the Christians there are. But true baptism only comes through repentance. True baptism doesn't come from going underwater. True baptism comes 
through repentance and faith. Believe and re uh, repent and believe the gospel. So real repentance obviously is a necessary step. Repentance is turning from one direction to another. So the ones that have come under grace have turned their lives and they're going towards the kingdom of God. Their life is not their own. They're not walking perfectly. Still a lot of, a lot of spiritual flaws but they're walking in the direction of the kingdom of God. We've put our old ways behind us. That isn't what we want. We want this way. And we're walking under grace. But walking, of course, as defined by God's law, which defines right and wrong. That's how we live. That often becomes a hang-up. It's kind of a tricky, tricky uh, issue. And it becomes a hang-up for many people. Well, they're under grace. Well, then there is no law. Well, you, can, you can go either way to an extreme where the law saves you or certain doctrines save you. And that doesn't work either. Uh, a couple more verses, Romans chapter 3, verse 24, Romans 3, 24. Romans 3, 24 um, justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You have to repent and be baptized. Then you're under grace. You're in the family. You're in the home. You're going to the, ma you're going to the magical kingdom. <laughs> just like the child. You're going to go to the magical kingdom. Unless you really just rebel against it. Well, Gal uh, Galatians chapter 2, I'll just mention it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. How do you frustrate the grace of God? How would somebody frustrate God's grace? I don't know how many of you have heard the story about Todd and Kara Storch. T uh, Todd and Kara Storch. This was back in 2013, and they're parents of uh, three children at the time. And they're, um, they were on a ski trip in Colorado, actually from Texas, I believe. They were on a ski trip in Colorado, having a wonderful time. And actually, it was time to go home. It was the last run of the day, going back home. You know, great trip, great skiing, and all of that. Uh, unfortunately, their 13-year-old daughter, Taylor, lost control, hit a tree, and died. Terrible, terrible event. Wonderful family outing and having fun and laughing and next moment, child didn't recover, hitting her head against a tree, I get out of control and lose control of the skis, which can, when, certainly can happen. Well, they decided that they were going to go ahead and try to be of help to other people and donate Taylor's organs, but five different organs that went out to different people. They don't tell you who they're going to because they're on a donor list and they sent out and, and people get, um, you know, the help and they decided to do that. Well, Taylor's heart went to a, Pat a Patricia Winters. She lived in Phoenix. A Patricia was 40 years old. Taylor was 13. She's getting this 13-year-old heart. She's 40 years old. She's a nurse and she has two children, but after her second child, she developed a actually a life-threatening and fatal heart condition. She was not going to make it with the heart that she had, this 40-year, a heart disease. Couldn't any longer take care. She just didn't have the energy to take care of her two children. And she wasn't going to live much longer with the heart that she had. Well, she ended up getting Taylor's heart. Now, they don't exactly uh, tell you as I mentioned before, whose, whose organ you're getting, but you know social media, everybody's talking about this, and somebody got killed, and they donated their heart, and then somebody gets it, and you can kind of piece things together, and that's what was done. Patricia, and then, then of course, Kara, the mother, were able to figure out exactly who got Taylor's heart. And so they decided that they would actually meet each other. And so the Storches went to Arizona to meet Patricia. And you can imagine what an emotional meeting that was because here's this woman and your daughter's heart 
is in her chest and beating in her chest and keeping her alive. And of course, your daughter, your daughter is gone. It was a very emotional, emotional meeting because she, had, she actually had Taylor's heart in her. Well, Patricia, being a nurse, she actually let, she let uh, uh, Tara or Kara have her stethoscope to listen to her daughter's heart, which was in, which was in Patricia. And uh, the husband did, did that well. Just a very heart-rending story uh, that was actually on ABC, sometime, uh, ABC News some time ago. And just the experience and what that was to hear, your own daughter's heart beating and this person was in this person keeping them alive. And of course they carried on a relationship after that because of that connection and that bond that that heart and what was done uh, for her, what that meant to everyone. Well, I guess we could say by the grace of the Storches, Patricia was living. It was by their grace. How, so in answering the question, how, how do we frustrate the grace of God? Like Paul said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. How do we do that? Well, think of the story, Patricia, and having Taylor's heart. What would frustrate the, the grace of the Taylors would be for Patricia thinking she deserved to get Taylor's heart. Get out of my way, everybody. Else. That, I, that belongs to me. I should get that heart. I'm better than other people. I, I've, I've earned this heart. Maybe believing she's superior to other people. I'm supposed to get that. Well, now, wait a minute. That isn't, the way it, that isn't the way it developed. Nobody was really, the parents are thinking, well, you, nobody's deserving of our daughter's heart. That's our gift. That's her heart. You need to be thankful for that. It was a gift. Well, this is what the Galatians were doing. Let's look at Galatians 2.21. We read the first part. Galatians 2.21 In Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Well, what were they doing in Galatia? I don't frustrate the grace of God that came through the sacrifice of his son, making us a part of the family and having these wonderful promises and gifts. If righteousness come by the law, well, then Christ is dead in vain. Who needed him? We'll just minutely do that law and the rituals and everything, and we'll be ushered into the kingdom because we deserve the kingdom. And some people were developing that. You better be circumcised, and you better keep this ritual. You better do that, and you better you know, be very stoical, and all this self-discipline, and beating of the body, and be righteous enough, and holy enough, and better than, than others. And God will see how wonderful you are, and he'll give you the kingdom because of your goodness. That's what they were being taught. And Paul said, you're, you're veering off on this. You're missing this. The goodness of God, the grace of God that does that. So no self-righteousness is allowed in God's church or God's kingdom. Nobody boasting of their wonderful spirituality and looking down on other people. That frustrates the grace of God. You start feeling puffed up and worthy of these things. Well, that's one side. What's another way that, that uh, Patricia could frustrate the good graces of the Storches and allowing her to have their, her heart? They could have buried their daughter without giving organs to anybody. What would frustrate it? Well, what would frustrate the good graces of the Storches would be for, for Patricia to simply be disregarding of any kind of care of the heart she was given. Now, well, she's, going to, she's smoking, she's taking drugs, she's in all wrong kind of diet, you're not getting any kind of activity, you're doing everything that's harmful to a heart. Well, I give you this heart and that's how you treat our daughter's heart? Trample on it in that way and disregard it? Show no respect? You, you don't try to keep it healthy? Do the right things. Don't care about that. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. How do we frustrate the grace of God? Romans 6, 1. Romans 6, what, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Oh, no. 
No, don't, don't go there. That's not what grace is about. That's what it, how it's interpreted often, the way it's applied. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Let me read a couple more of those verses. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How could you receive a heart and to give you life once again, and now you mistreat the, that organ? Do everything that's harmful to it. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin go right back to the same thing because, well, we're under all this wonderful grace. Can't do that. And it talks about being buried in baptism. <clears throat> Verse 6, the, knowing the old man is crucified with him, the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That's how you're going to frustrate the promises, the grace of God, sinning willfully, disregarding that. Like not taking care of a, a heart that you've been given. Romans 3, 31. Paul had to bring this out. This sometimes is where others lean in that direction, where we're under grace, we've accepted Christ as Savior, we've got these problems, we're under grace, and we're saved. Romans 3.31, do we then make void the law through faith? Well, God forbid, he said, we establish it. Now we're more keenly aware of the spiritual values of the moral law of God, because that's, that's God's mind, it's God's heart. More keenly aware of that, not because now we're going to earn it or it saves us, but it'd be like being given a heart and we were on our deathbed, somebody through the good graces grants us a heart, we're more keenly aware of what it takes to have a healthy heart, wouldn't we? Wouldn't you do that? If you didn't, you'd be frustrating that wonderful gift you were given. Well, that can happen spiritually, spiritually as well. We don't honor God and his grace by disobeying his commandments. That actually could lead to costing us salvation because it, it erodes faith in a right heart. If that gets eroded enough, then we're just not, not in that same. We leave the family spiritually. God doesn't leave us, we leave him. Well, God, in following this story, God has actually replaced our heart. You know, we were Patricia spiritually. God has replaced the heart that we were born with. It wasn't working right. It was, it was getting hard. The heart in society is getting harder and harder. The love of many are waxing cold. The heart is turning cold. The heart is diseased. Not going to last. Life in society is not going to last. There's something wrong with the heart. Well, God has given us the heart of his son. He's replaced our heart. We now have the heart of Christ who died for us. That's why we have the special bond with God the Father. He sees the heart of Christ in us. Just like uh, the um, Storches saw in Patricia... She's just another person who lives in Phoenix. Why was she any special? Well, inside of her was the heart of their daughter. They could hear it. Inside of God's people is the heart of Christ. It's supposed to be. And that creates a bond. And there's something special. We're those children. And therefore, we come under the grace of God. And often, of course, obviously in this life, we've got to go back to that grace. Sometimes we have to turn and look at, well, what's your, what's your behavior? What are you doing? What are your actions? And sometimes you have to go back to the grace of God and realize that God forgives us and God loves us as a family member. And if we get back on track, well, all of that can be forgiven and, and forgotten. So we don't honor God by disobeying his commandment. That's two ways we frustrate the grace of God. Well, we all have to come, as God's people, to own the biblical definition of grace. You've got to come to own that. That doesn't make void the law. 
but it recognizes the role of grace and the goodness and the gift of God. You have to own that you're in that family, just like that child. Finally got it. She was finally in a home and a family. She knew they accepted her. She was a child. Hadn't seen that before. So she acted out what she knew I'll never live up to and be good enough and perfect enough to get to Disneyland, they're all, Disney World, they'll always find a reason to leave me home. So she acted that out until she felt something different and it changed her. Well, that God, we can change too. And part of it is the story of grace. <clears throat> we are part of God's family if we desire to remain in the family. The promises are passed on to us. Don't, we don't deserve them, haven't earned them. We do respect them. We don't frustrate that grace. We dare not do that. These are some of the reasons we need Passover and unleavened bread and all the holy days. Brings us back to what's going on. What is this plan? Who are we? What's taking place? What's the role of the grace of God in our lives? Or the law of God? They all have a, it all has a role. I'll conclude here this afternoon with this message, kind of beginning to introduce the spring holy days, Passover and unleavened bread. I'll conclude, <clears throat> I think he said it as well, as well as I can, the Apostle Paul. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 18. This is what he wrote on many occasions, so I'll leave this with all of you as well. It's not Paul's words, it's not my words, though he felt it, and I certainly do as well, but it's from God where God said in 2 Thessalonians 3.18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.